Welcome to our second lesson in our Introduction to Material Processing course, part two. In this lesson, we're focusing on four key variables, temperature, pressure, environment, and time, and seeing how they impact our material processing. Today's video is focused on pressure. Now, depending on your familiarity with material processing techniques, you may already understand the impact pressure can have on a material process. Processes, especially those focused on changing a material shape, often utilize pressure to help them do so. An example of this is the stamping of pieces of sheet metal to create things like pots and pans, cups, or soda pop cans. These pieces of material that come together are called dies, and they apply high pressures to my sheet metal and allow me to form these different parts pretty quickly. These dies must be able to withstand these high pressures over and over and over again. So they're made out of materials that are quite hard and are generally pretty expensive. Because of this, these processing techniques are generally only used for parts that are mass produced, like pop cans. But pressure can have more of an impact than just changing a material shape. Maybe you live at a higher elevation or you've seen in various recipes, particularly baking recipes, steps that say for higher altitudes, do X, Y, and Z. This is because pressure, including atmospheric pressure, influences the phase of a material that exists at a specific temperature and composition. We saw in our temperature lesson earlier that we care a lot about the phases and phase transitions of materials during processing. Now we can visualize the impact that this has through something called a phase diagram. As we introduced in our temperature lesson, our phase diagrams help us understand what impact that pressure, temperature, and composition have on my material, and what phases are going to be present, depending on the combination of all of these three variables. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a hologram, so I'm not actually able to display this in three dimensions. Instead, we rely on 2D visualizations with the understanding that one of my variables will be held constant. An example I like to use to illustrate the impact of pressure is the phase diagram for water. In this case, my composition is constant. It's simply H2O. We can see pressure in atmospheres along my y-axis and temperature in degrees centigrade along my x-axis. At one atmosphere, which is our standard atmospheric pressure, water freezes at zero degrees C and boils at 100. But if I lower my pressure, down to 0.006 atmospheres and cool my water down to 0.01 degrees C, I achieve what's called a triple point, where liquid water, water vapor, and ice can all exist at the same time. Wild, right? Now, why does this matter? Well, we know liquid water has a very high surface tension. Some materials, like aerogels and biological cells, need to be dried for various applications. But going from liquid water to water vapor could destroy these very delicate materials due to this surface tension. By manipulating the pressure and temperature of our system, we can avoid the liquid to gas phase transition through either supercritical drying, where we move our system beyond where there's a difference between liquid and gas, or freeze drying, where I simply transition from ice to water vapor without ever entering the liquid phase. We can use these techniques of manipulating pressure and temperature and composition of our materials in many ways during processing. Before we finish up our discussion about the impacts of pressure on processing, I want to highlight one thing. Pressure can have both a positive and a negative sign. This is dependent on what pressure we're applying to our material and can make discussing pressure a little bit confusing. We've already seen an example of applying a positive pressure to our material. It was in our stamping that we saw at the beginning of this video. But what does negative pressure look like? Negative pressure is often what we're referring to when we're pulling vacuum on something. We're removing atmospheric pressure. But this is pretty hard to visualize. An example of this is degassing, or removing the air bubbles from an epoxy resin. Now, if I'm trying to make something out of epoxy, I don't want air bubbles in my system. Unfortunately, when mixing my two-part epoxy together, 
I often end up with air bubbles. To remove these, we can utilize something called a bell jar. A bell jar is a vessel that we can pull vacuum on and it won't crumple. So I can place my mixed up resin inside this bell jar. And as I am pulling vacuum or applying negative pressure to the inside of my bell jar, which includes my resin, what's going to happen is the air bubbles inside the epoxy, which are at atmospheric pressure, will expand, float to the top and pop. Therefore, they're removed from my resin. After this process, I'm able to use my epoxy for whatever my application was. And I know that I've gotten rid of the air bubbles, which can cause unsightly defects and decreased mechanical properties. And with that, we've finished highlighting the impacts that pressure can have on processing. Our next variable, we're focusing on environment. We'll spend some time defining what we mean by environment during processing, and we'll see how our processing environments and final application environments impact our processing.